All right, can you hear me now? All right, just a few announcements to touch on today. First off, if uh, you were planning on being at the uh, information class that was scheduled for this afternoon, it has been canceled. The folks that were going to be there had, had, couldn't make it, so we're rescheduling that. Be looking for another date um, for that in the future. Other one is uh, Matthew will be uh, placing another T-shirt order if you didn't get yours in the first time around. Uh, if you would get with Matthew and let him know what size you like or he can give you some information on that. Um, the other thing I'd like to touch on today is the Easter egg hunt will be next Saturday, March the 30th, from 10 to 11.30 a.m. here at the church. I believe we do still need some candy for that, so if you would, bring some, donate it. The baskets are at the Welcome Center and then the Fellowship Hall as well. There are a host of other things on your bulletin today, looking red on that first page. There, I'm not going to touch on them all. Uh, the final thing I guess I would say this week is we will have Good Friday service coming up this Friday at 6 p.m. We hope that you would join us for that. Um, we, it is always a good time to come to church. We're glad to be here and joyful to be in God's house. It's particularly good when you get to baptize, and we've got two of those this morning. So with that, I would like to read one little verse from Romans chapter 10. This is Romans chapter 10, verse 9. It says this. It says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Let's pray together this morning. Lord God, you are so far above us. God, you are more powerful than we are and your ways are higher than ours, God. And they are beyond our understanding and for some reason, God, you saw fit to sacrifice your son, God, on the cross um, to save us from our sins. He died a death he did not deserve. He died the one that we did, Lord, so that we could be reconciled to you. And, God, we thank you for that. You provide us with so many things here on this earth, food and shelter and clothing. And, God, we need those things, and we praise you for your provision there. But, God, it would mean nothing if we didn't have your salvation the salvation that you bring to us, God, that we can come into your presence again. We thank you for that, God. I pray for our service today. Lord, we thank you that you have brought two more believers into your house, um, God, and, and we just ask you to continue to move in our church. God, help us to be effective disciples of yours in our community. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Jasper. We're going to begin our service with, uh, with baptism this morning, and what a great way to uh, to worship God and to, to just start the service. Jesus commanded us to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that he had commanded us, and he promised that he would be with us until the end of the age. And so a person is not baptized to become a Christian. They are baptized because they have already believed in Jesus and that they have been born again. Baptism is a way of identifying as a follower of Jesus. I say this every time, but it's worth repeating. In our, in our tradition, in church tradition and Christianity today, the way we have churches, a lot of times the way a person identifies that they're following Jesus is they'll come forward in an invitation and make that public. In the first century, the way they did, they were baptized. And through baptism, they were identifying, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. But it's so much more than that. And you'll hear this in the message a little bit later. But it's so much more than that because it's not just identifying as a follower of Jesus. We are identifying with his death. And this is a picture of the burial of the old life and the resurrection to walk in newness of life. And it is all because of the finished work of Jesus and what he has done on our behalf through his death on the cross. And so being baptized uh, this morning, first of all, is Grady Aldridge. So come on down, Grady. Had the, the awesome privilege of spending some time uh, with Grady for several weeks. He works through, we have a, a Bible study for kids that they walk through that talks about the gospel and the significance of understanding salvation and sin and God and Jesus and the cross and the gospel. 
and he has worked through that, and then uh, he and his dad and I, we all sat down on Wednesday nights and went through that. It was a couple of years ago that, uh, that, that God brought Grady to the place where he realized his need for a Savior, and he called on Jesus to save him. And, uh, and we've talked about that several times in our, in our meetings, and man, he is dead on just confident that that experience, that he asked Jesus to save him. And here's the best part of that. Just like the verse that, um, that Jasper mentioned, if we call upon the name of the Lord, he says that he'll save us. And that's what uh, Grady did. And so, man, what, a, what an, amazing, an amazing thing. I want to pray for him. He's got family and grandparents and maybe great-grandparents that are here. Um, so I want to pray for him, and I want you, as I pray, I want you to just lift him before the Lord as well. So, Father, I just say thank you. Uh, for what you have done through Jesus Christ. I thank you for the salvation that is ours through him, that you make it possible. And God, I thank you that, that we don't just wake up one day that we're going to believe in Jesus. You initiate that. You draw us to yourself, and then we respond in repentance and faith, calling on your name, believing in you, putting our faith in you, repenting of our sin. And God, you promise that when we do that, that we will be born again. And I thank you that Grady has done that. I pray, Lord, that you help him as he grows in his faith. Help him to just know you more intimately and personally. And God, I pray for your hand to be on his life and that you would raise him up to use him in a godly way to your honor and to your glory. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Grady, my brother, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Also being baptized this morning is Nicole Swindoll. Now, Nicole is Nicole. She's her own person, but let me make the connection for y'all. This is uh, Jessica's sister-in-law, Jessica Rahim's sister-in-law. Uh, Derek is her husband, and that's Jessica's brother, okay? And they've got family that are here uh, to, to see this and to, to watch this this morning. Um, again, had the amazing privilege to, to sit down with Jessica um, a couple of months ago, maybe, and and just talk about um, what God was doing in her life. And uh, she sat there in my study and just called on the name of the Lord to save her. And do you know what he did? He saved her because he's faithful, faithful, faithful to do that. Uh, Jessica didn't, didn't, I mean, Nicole did not grow up in uh, a Christian home necessarily and did not learn about God till, till later in her, in her life. Um, one thing that, Jess, that uh, Nicole mentioned to me was that she came here to a fall festival and, and just the impact of people in our church just welcoming her and loving her and showing kindness to her made a huge difference in her believing in God and coming to faith. And I just think that is absolutely, absolutely incredible. I'm so proud of you and what God's doing in your life and in your family and I want to pray for you, and I want to ask you as a church to pray for her as well. God, I, I'm just so grateful that, that, Lord, that you do not give up. You keep seeking us out. And I thank you for the way that you arrange things in our lives, Lord, and you put us in the places where we can experience your presence and that we can come to know you personally and I thank you, Lord, for how you've done that in Nicole's life, and you have brought her to that place. And God, it was real. It was, it was without a doubt that you were speaking to her. And Lord, she called upon your name in repentance and faith and asked you to forgive her and save her, and Lord, you did. And I just praise you for that. I pray, pray that you help her to grow in her faith. You help her to know you more intimately and personally. You help her, God, to, to just become the woman, the mom, the wife that you have called her to be. I pray for her influence in the life of, of her daughter, 
And uh, God, that that child with, with what Derek and Nicole will do will come to know you herself at the appropriate time. And so, God, we just say thank you. Be glorified in her life. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Nicole, my sister, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Well, stand if you will. You know, this is, this is all possible and happened because of what God did through Jesus. And John 3.16 is just an amazing uh, way of stating that. So repeat that with me, if you will. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. If you'll turn and greet one another in the Lord this morning. Good morning.
Children, come forward. One, two, three. Good morning. Good morning. All right. At the same time, all heaven is rejoicing right now. Everybody give a big round of applause for these two that have just entered into eternity and heaven forever. Well, it's a good day to be in the Lord's house today, and we're going to go back in time today. You want to go back in time? Yeah. All right. About three weeks ago, Mr. Bill drove up. He and, his, and my wife and I drove up out in the parking lot. And when we drove up, we saw a little kildee out here in the parking lot. A little bird running around in circles and frantic and holding one wing out and acting like it was crippled and everything. And for many, many years, these same type birds have nested in the parking lot here in the church. And every year about this time, you'll find one of them out there. Well, as soon as I saw the bird, I knew she had a nest. And um, as we got ready to park, I pulled up there close to her, and I saw the nest. And those nests had four eggs in them. Mo, you showing some of them right now? And this was three weeks ago. So today I drove up, and she was gone. But two of the eggs were missing, and two are still in there. There's a lesson, as y'all look at these pictures and everything, have you showed the video yet, Mo? This was last Sunday. You see, everybody get to see it? You can show some of the, some of the slides of her single. But what, what I want you to understand, kids, this little bird, Akildi, has a great lesson for you today. And I want you to listen to some of the things that this little bird wants to teach you today. First of all, this little mother has sat on her nest for some three weeks. You know what I'd call that? Devotion. This little bird for three weeks has protected her nest and she's never left it. She sat on it during the cold weather and the hot weather and the rain. I'd call that patience. She's had 
probably other critters like cats and hawks and owls and things like that around her at all times. And she showed courage by defending her, her nest out there as well. One of the things that she had to do in order for those eggs to hatch was to shelter them. And she sat on that nest patiently giving them shelter and protection. One of the things that she endured was pain. I'm sure it wasn't a, a something that she looked forward to every day, having to sit out there in those rocks and the cold weather and the rain and things of this nature. But she did it because she loved her children. The next thing that she did was she sacrificed. She fat sacrificed her own time to be doing her own thing. And she stayed with that nest for some three weeks in order for two of those eggs to hatch. And I, she, I don't know if she'll come back and if those other two will hatch or not. I don't know the, the, what she's got in mind or where she's at. But she's not out there today. But we're going to still protect her. But the greatest thing that she showed of, of, of all these things that I've mentioned this morning is a word called love. The love for her babies, the dedication for her babies, and for all that she did for her babies. Does that remind you of someone that we know very well? I think his name is Jesus. He showed us protection. He shows us shelter. He delivers us from our pains. He sacrifices for us. It's going to be a busy week this week for Jesus. It's going to be a busy week. Take time this week in your devotion time to read the things that Jesus did for you during the course of this week. It took three weeks for those eggs to hatch. It took 33 years for Jesus to fulfill his mission for you and I. I want to read something to you this morning that describes this bird and what Jesus has done for you. This comes out of the book of Deuteronomy the 31st chapter, and it's the 8th verse. And it says this. It said, The Lord himself goes before you, and he will be with you always. He will never leave nor forsake you. Never be afraid, and do not be discouraged. That bird was never afraid. It was never discouraged. And as Jesus was on the cross, you were on his mind. Think about this week about the simplicity of a little kildee out there and the lesson that it can teach you. But most of all, do you know that you know that you know that Jesus is your Lord and Savior today? If not, you too can come and know the saving grace of Jesus today. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your creatures. We thank you for the lesson that a kildee can teach us and for the attributes that it has and the characteristics that were shown forth through Jesus as he died on the cross for us today. Father, we thank you for those that have been saved today and baptized, and we look forward to seeing many, many more giving their lives to Jesus. Thank you for this day. Thank you for these children. Thank you for each family that is represented here today, Lord, and bless them in a special way. And most of all, we thank you for your son, Jesus. And we ask these things in Christ's name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. If y'all can please stand with us.
Thank you. It's good to have you here. What great worship uh, this morning, as always, and I'm grateful for your presence here. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. If you happen to have been in Sunday school this morning um, and you're using the curriculum, then uh, you'll, you'll discover that there, there's some similarity, at least in the scripture passage, of what we're going to, to be looking at um, today. So this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Those are the words that are found in Psalm 118, and while they could be uh, true about and applied to every single day of our lives, of this world since it began, um, they also are more importantly about one significant day, and that significant day has to do with the death and the burial of re and the resurrection ultimately of Jesus, but the focus being on the fact that he died and the payment of our sin. And I think you would agree, especially if you have come to the place in your life where you have believed in Jesus, then you would agree that that single day, that significant day, impacts all of our days. And that's why the psalmist could say uh, we can rejoice in the Lord and that we can be glad and rejoice because of all that he has done through this specific day, namely the day that Jesus died for us on the cross. I find it really encouraging that, um, that in that psalm, Psalm 118, is the verse of scripture that was, that was said on the day that Jesus made that triumphal entry into Jerusalem on the day that we refer to as Palm Sunday. And uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, Hosanna, and, uh, and so what a, what a great tie. That's why I say that this verse in Psalm 118 applies to that significant day, that day in which uh, Jesus died for our sin. I want you to uh, look at a passage of Scripture this morning, and it's a, it's a long passage, and, and I haven't really wrestled with whether to read it or not. I've wrestled with whether... Uh, my voice was going to hold out to do it, but I'm going to trust that God's going to let that happen. Um, but I want you to see the flow of the events that happened, beginning with the arrest of Jesus, all the way up to, to the very point that he died on the cross. And then I want to, to look at those, uh, some details within that, and, uh, and just show you some things related to it. I want to begin in verse 54 in Luke chapter 22. Luke writes and says, having arrested him, they led him away and brought him to the house of the high priest, but Peter was following at a distance. And then I want you to move over to verse 63, and the part that I'm just bypassing has to do with the, the point in time when when Peter denied that he knew Jesus, that's the text that I'm, I'm not reading over, beginning in verse 63. He says, now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him and beating him. And they blindfolded him and were asking him, saying, prophesy, who is the one who hit you? And they were saying many other things against him, blaspheming. When it was day, the council of the elders of the people assembled both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council chamber, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you a question, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God." And they all said, are you the son of God? Are you the son of God then? And he said to them, yes, I am. Then they said, what further need do we have of testimony? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. Then the whole body of them got up and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar and saying that, he is 
the, he is Christ, a king. So Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, It is as you say. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they kept on insisting, saying, He stirs up the people teaching all over Judea, starting from Galilee, even as far as this place. When Pilate heard it, he asked whether the man was a Galilean, and when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was in Jerusalem at the time. Now Herod was very glad when he saw Jesus, for he had wanted to see him for a long time because he had been hearing about him and was hoping to see some sign performed by him. And he questioned him at some length, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and the scribes were standing there accusing him vehemently. And Herod, with his soldiers, after treating him with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. Now Herod and Pilate became friends with one another that day, for before they had been enemies with each other. Pilate summoned the chief priest and the rulers of the people and said to them, you brought this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion. And behold, having examined him before you, I have found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you make against him. No, nor has Herod, for he sent him back to us. And behold, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. Now he was obliged to release to them at the feast, one prisoner. Verse 18. But they cried out all together, saying, Away with this man and release for us Barabbas. He was one who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection made in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again. But they kept on calling out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And he said to them the third time, Why, what evil has this man done? I have found in him no guilt demanding death. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. But they were insistent with loud voices, asking that he be crucified, and their voices began to prevail. And Pilate pronounced sentence that their demand be granted. And he released the man they were asking for who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, but he delivered Jesus to their will. When they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, coming in from the country and placed on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. And following him was a large crowd of people and of women who were mourning and lamenting him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, Stop weeping for me, for weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others also, who, who were criminals, were being led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place called the skull, where they crucified him, the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by looking on, and even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him and offering him sour wine, saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there, there was also an inscription above, above him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself. But the other answered and rebuked him and said, Do, not even, do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation. And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, 
remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. It was about the sixth hour and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour because the sun was obscured and the veil in the temple was torn in two. And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had happened, he began praising God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds who came together for this spectacle, when they observed what had happened, began to return, beating their breast. And all the acquaintances and the women who accompanied him from Galilee were standing at a distance, seeing these things. You know, I think it's, it's really difficult to, for me even trying to read that, to try to capture uh, the, the drama, the passion, the, the significance of what was happening through, you know, this whole experience. And granted, it covered several hours of time. But it's really hard to, for us to, to just read it or even talk about it and think about it and try to just, just with our minds, just comprehend what happened. In fact, when you look at the last two verses that I read, it said the crowds, when they saw the spectacle, it said they began to beat, beat their breasts, which was a sign of remorse. And, and in some ways, maybe a sign of repentance, a change of mind about, about what they had seen and what had happened. And then it says that the acquaintances of Jesus, they just stood from a distance and they watched and they looked. I can't help but believe that, that there had to be people in the crowd that day that were saying, man, what just happened? What did we just see happen? And possibly they had seen crucifixions at other time, but this one was drastically different in so many different ways, from the words that Jesus, and Luke only records a part of them, from the words that were spoken by Jesus as, as from the cross to the people, the fact that the darkness prevailed for a period of time and, and, and the, the, the veil in the temple was torn in two. I mean, just everything all together was so different from any other crucifixion. I just believe that they had to have walked away and just simply say, man, what on earth happened here? Well, I believe because what happened is this is the day the Lord has made. This is what God had planned. This is what God had, had put into motion. And I think that you can look at the details of what Luke gives us, just some of the details. And when you begin to look at them in light of what we know from the rest of the New Testament, you can begin to see that the events that happened on this day that I just read to you, those events are like living pictures of the very gospel itself. And so when, when you see them, you can begin to put together the pieces and you're able to say, oh yes, this is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day that he set apart for his son to die. And here's why his son died. And so I want to show you uh, three specific events that took place within uh, the passage that I just read, and I want to show you how I see it from what the scripture says of exactly what happened on that day. Look at verse 17. The first statement I would make is what happened that day is that the guilty go free. Now, the text that I've called your attention to. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to point out some things within it in just a moment. Is the part where Barabbas was, and Jesus were put before the religious people, before the Jews. And the question was, who's going to be released? According to what the translation I read said that it was a custom on that day to release a prisoner during Passover. And so Barabbas is here. And Jesus is here, and they're placed before, in sort of like in Pilate's court in a sense, and they're placed before the people who's going to be released. Well, when I read the text, you may have picked up on it, but there is a sharp contrast between the man Barabbas and obviously the man Jesus. Look at verse 19, if you will. Chapter 23, verse 19. We're given this side note about Barabbas. 
it says he was, he was one who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection made in the city and for murder. Look at verse 25. It says when he finally released him, it says he released the man that they were asking for who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, but he delivered Jesus to their will. I think it's in Matthew's account when Matthew records this, Matthew identifies Barabbas as a notorious prisoner or a notorious criminal. And so all I want you to see is that the man Barabbas that was placed before them, who are we going to release? The man Barabbas was known to be guilty of crimes. And he was guilty. But look at what is said about Jesus. Look at Luke 23, chapter 23, verse 22. Pilate said to them, to the religious leaders and everyone that was there, in verse 22, Pilate said, Why do you want to crucify him, basically? What evil has this man done? I have found no guilt demanding of death. And so Pilate, who's examining Jesus, says, You know, here's Barabbas, he's a notorious criminal, and here's Jesus, and he says, I find no guilt guilt in him. In fact, look back at chapter 23 and verse 4 because that wasn't the first time that he said it. In verse 4, Pilate said to the chief priests and the, and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. Look at verse 14, chapter 23. He said to them, you brought this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion and behold, having examined him before you, I have found no guilt in him, in this man regarding the charges which, which you make against him. And then in verse 15, this was Herod's, when he came back from Herod, this was Herod's uh, conclusion. There is nothing deserving of death been, that has been done by this man. In fact, also in Matthew's gospel, in Matthew 27 and verse 19, Pilate's wife comes out to him and says she had had a dream. She said, have nothing to do with this righteous man. So, what do you have there? I mean, it is a graphic picture of the gospel. It is a graphic picture of what Jesus does on our behalf. Because ultimately, they asked for Barabbas to be released, and they took Jesus to be crucified. Isn't that the gospel? That the guilty go free and the innocent dies on behalf of the guilty. That's the gospel. In fact, Peter said, look at, at 1 Peter chapter 3. And verse 18. Peter said, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. And so when you look at this account of what was happening with the release of Barabbas, is you see the guilty going free and the innocent, the just one, dying in the place of the guilty. And that, my friend, is the gospel. That's what happened on this day. When you look at the events that's recorded in the gospels and you ask the question, what just happened? What happened was that the guilty go free. Let me show you the second detail here that, that shows this. Look at verse 26. It says, when they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, coming in from the country, and they placed on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. And so, the guilty go free because Jesus took our place. That's what I want you to have in your mind. That's the second detail. That's the second thing that happened. Because Jesus took our place, the guilty go free. Now, I want you just to picture this. This man, Simon, we don't know a whole lot about him. One of the Gospels mentions his boys, 
Some tie one of the boys, I think it's Rufus, ties him with, um, uh, with Paul and his ministry. Can't verify that, but it, Rufus was a common name. But the guy's coming in from the country, and the Roman soldiers could do it. They could just take a person and say, do this, and you are obliged to do it. And so Simon's coming in. They seize him. I like the way that Luke says it. They seize him. And they demand that he carry the cross of Jesus. And so he took the cross and he carried it to the place where Jesus would be crucified. Now, some have said, well, Jesus was weakened because of the beating. And, and if you've seen, uh, read of those kinds of things, uh, it, it would be obvious that it would be very difficult for him, having lost so much blood and gone through so much, to be able to carry that cross all the way to the place. And it's not a short walk. I remember... In 1986, I went to Israel, and they call it the Via Dolorosa. And, and I remember just walking that path all the way up to where it was. And so Simon is grabbed, seized, and he has to care. Listen to this. The custom was that the guilty carried their own cross. That the one condemned carried their own cross. And so the reality is, that Jesus, it wasn't his cross anyway, it was our cross. And Peter, repre- I mean, Simon represents what all of us should have been and would have been and had to do was to carry our own cross. But I want you to guess, get this picture in your mind. Because, you know, the scene is not just this quaint little walk. I mean, there's crowds, there's, there's all this that's going on. Simon is taken and he has to carry the cross. But when he gets to the place of crucifixion, He lays down the cross, and he walks away, and Jesus lays on the cross, and they nail him to the cross. I'm telling you, why could a man like Barabbas, guilty, condemned, why could a man like Barabbas walk free? Because Jesus took his place. Why can you and I be saved? Why do we not have to pay the penalty for our sin? Because Jesus took our place. Every one of us in this room, every one of us, is guilty of sin, every one of us. And it doesn't matter the sin, it's just the fact that we sinned. I mean, there's a sharp contrast between between how Grady has grown up in his life and Nicole and her experience in her life. But I'm telling you, it took every bit of Jesus on the cross to save Nicole and to save Grady as well. It's just the way that it is, because all have sinned and all are in need of a Savior. I want you to go back to Isaiah 53, and I want you to see this. I just want you to get it in your mind. I mean, we're going to talk. You'll you'll hear so much this week, possibly, about the cross and about the death of Jesus. And I want you to so much have it in your mind that He took your place. Listen to what Isaiah said centuries before. Verse 4. It says, surely our grief, griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Listen to verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. Look at verse 8. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut out cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. Listen to this. To whom the stroke was due. It wasn't his. What he experienced, it was you and me. We're the ones that deserved that. And then verse 12. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great. He will divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out himself to death. He was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for transgressors. Peter said it in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. He said, he bore our sins 
on the cross. Paul said it like this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. He said, God made him, talking about Jesus, God made him who knew no sin because he was just and righteous and innocent. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. So he took our place. And you know what? Man, that ought to be that ought to be reason to rejoice. That's why the psalmist said, you know what? This is the day the Lord has made has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Why? Because the guilty get to go free, all because Jesus took our place. You've heard me say this before, but I just love saying it. I remember not long after, after I got saved, I remember just in my heart to the Lord, just saying, Lord, you had so many opportunities. You could have put a bolt of lightning in me. You could have squashed me to the ground. You could have punished me for my sin and how I lived my life. Why not? And as clear as I hear my own voice, though it wasn't God speaking in my heart, he said, Hal, I punished my son in your place. You didn't get off and scot-free. My son paid the debt that you owed. My friend, that is the grace of God. That is the mercy of God. And I think it is beautifully portrayed in what Simon did, which all of us, it was our cross, and Jesus took our place. Last, last detail I want you to see back in Luke has to do with the, the exchange between Jesus and and the two thieves. And here's the statement. So the first statement is the guilty go free. The second statement, this is what we see in these details. The guilty go free because Jesus took our place. The third statement is this. It becomes a reality in our lives. It becomes our own personal experience when we repent of our sin and we believe in him. And you see that in this exchange between Jesus and these two thieves. Look at verse 32 in uh, Luke 23. It says, Two others also who were criminals were being led away to be put to death with him. When they came to that place, to the place called the skull, there they, were, they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. Skip down to verse 39. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling in abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other one answered, rebuking him, and said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then he was saying to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then Jesus said this to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Do you know what this is? I mean, this is, this to me is, is the gospel and how it becomes a reality in our lives. You have one thief that is railing it, that is offering abuse to Jesus. Save yourself and us. Then you have the other criminal who says to Jesus, who says to the other thief, why are you doing that? We are guilty. We deserve what we're getting. And then he looks to Jesus and he says the things that he said. And here's what that amounts to. One, it was the admission of his guilt and his sin. And really, it was an act of repentance in verse 40 and verse 41. He said, we're, we are under the same sentence. We're suffering and we're receiving what we deserve. And he's acknowledging his sin. The second thing it is, it is a belief in Jesus. He recognized that there was something different about Jesus. And so he asked him, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. That, to me, is an acknowledgement that he recognized that Jesus truly is the Messiah. And he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he asked him, remember me 
And the result was Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. And you know what that means? It means that that criminal, acknowledging his sin, admitting his sin, acknowledging that Jesus is his only hope, and he calls out him to save him, and you know what Jesus does? He saves him. He saves him. And what an, ex- what an example, what a portrayal of the gospel. You say, yeah, but that man died. He, he died physically, but he did not die spiritually, and his body will be resurrected one day according to what the Bible teaches. And therein lies our hope, our hope. Well, what about the other criminal? Well, the implication would be that he did not believe in Jesus. He did not call on Jesus. So what happened to him? What happened to him was that he paid the penalty for his own sin. You remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane? And he said, he said, man, Lord, he said, Lord, if this cup can pass from me, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. And the cup that he was referring to was the judgment of God on the sin of man. Oh, I believe that the death of Jesus was, was horrible and devastating. But I believe Jesus, knowing what he was going to face and the wrath of God for the sin of humanity, when he took upon himself the judgment for sin that we deserved, and Jesus took it upon himself, that was much more, that was worse than anything physically that he was going through. And he said, let this cup pass, but nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. And he died, and he took that. So when the thief believed in Jesus, then Jesus' death is applied to him, and that man doesn't have to die for his sin because Jesus died for his sin. But the other criminal did not believe, and so he paid his own sin. The book of Revelation gives us some hint as to what that judgment would be like. In Revelation 14, verse 9, Then another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives the mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also, listen to this, he will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day or night. Those who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his hand. And then in Revelation 20 it says, John says, I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which are written in the books according to their deeds. The sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death the lake of fire, and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of of fire. I realize those, those are not really good words to end a message on, and I'm not, but they're truth. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish that that I just read, but would have eternal life. John 3, John 3, 17 and 18 says, Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He said this, He who believes is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the one and only Son of God. So the reality is, That that all of us, before salvation, all of us stood under the condemnation because we're guilty sinners and we stand under the condemnation to experience the wrath of God upon our sin, just like I read, ultimately ending in an eternity in hell. But you have the gospel. 
you have the day that God so planned from before the foundation of the world, we are told, that his son would come and he would take our place. He would die in our place, take the wrath of God. What I just read, he would take that upon himself that the guilty might go free because he took our place. And if we believe in him, it becomes a reality in our lives. And I'm saying to you today that if that's never happened in your life, today is the day. Now is the time. The opportunity is there. As God draws you to himself, as God convicts you of your sin and shows you you're a sinner in need of a Savior, all you have to do is call upon him in faith and repentance. And God says when we do, that he will save us. And my prayer is if that's never happened in your life, that you're hearing the gospel today and that you will respond to him by believing, admitting your sin, believing he is the Messiah, asking him to save you, and the Bible promises that he will. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord, I, I pray right now that you not let this moment just, just fly by. I pray right now that our hearts and our minds, Lord, are, are just attuned to you. And what I mean by that is, God, that we're, we're just sensitive to the fact that we are in your presence that we have heard and read truth. We have seen the, the glory of the gospel, that the guilty go free because Jesus took our place and it becomes a reality in our lives when we admit that we are sinners and we believe that Jesus is the only way and we ask him to save us. And I pray, Lord, I pray that, that you, you draw those that have not yet believed. That you would so powerfully right now by your spirit overwhelm them with the reality of their sin and then lead them to you to call upon your name that they might be saved. Do it now, Lord. God, help us as those who have believed. Help us, Lord. Help us, God, to, to be excited about what you have done, to rejoice and be glad in this day that you have planned, that you have brought about. May our salvation be real and exciting in our own hearts, Lord. God, have your way in our lives now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.